Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Abbey Museum's virtual programming on Indigenous methodologies. These virtual sessions are meant to highlight the ongoing work of Native researchers and scholars from across multiple disciplines, and we'll have additional presentations being added to our um, calendar very soon. So please uh, be sure to check out abbeymuseum.org for more updates and follow us on social media uh, to get all the latest news. Our next program that is scheduled is on October 14th at 4 p.m. with Dina uh, Helio Whitaker uh, with a presentation called Indigenous Knowledge and Moving Towards a Transformational Land Ethic. You can find out more about that uh, program and others on our website. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the land uh, from which the Abbey Museum is broadcasting today. We are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. We, we extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous peoples and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is now known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. We make this acknowledgement aware of the continual violations of water, territorial rights and sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. The Abbey is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they share their stories. And again, thank you all for joining us today. We're really pleased for today's program with Dr. Rebecca Sockbeeson. Dr. Sockbeeson of Penobscot Indian Nation is a political activist and scholar. She graduated from Harvard University where she received her, ma uh, her master's degree in education and went on to confer her PhD in Educational Policy Studies at the University of Alberta, specializing in Indigenous peoples education. Her research fo focuses on Indigenous knowledge, Aboriginal healing through language and culture, anti-racism and decolonization. She currently serves as Associate Professor at the University of Alberta's Indigenous Peoples Education Program. If you have any questions during this program, please submit them uh, using the Q&A box and Rebecca and I will get to those um, during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And without further delay, I'm going to be turning over the platform to Dr. Sok Beeson. I welcome you and I thank you for being with us today. It's very exciting um, and thank you so much. Right on. Thank you, Star. Okay, um, well, first of all, I want to uh, just acknowledge um, the, um, you know, the folks that have taken the time, you know, to come in and to, to listen to this. Um, I know the level of engagement is compromised because we're Zooming, um, but I want to say um, how deeply meaningful this opportunity is to me. Um, and any chance I can to, you know, be home and be amongst um you know our own people of the wabanaki confederacy and on the territories um i really you know take those real awesome opportunities so although we're zooming uh, my heart is very much there um and you know with that saying that i just want to you know s make a special um shout out to my family um and my nieces and nephews um that are on today that have been um messaging me on on the inbox on Facebook. Um, I love you so dearly and um, and it really is so distinctly meaningful to me um, that you're that you're listening in um, that my space the space that um, divides us from me being here in a pandemic because I haven't seen you all in over a year um, is certainly is no measurement um, you know for the deep love that I have for you. So I'm glad to be sharing with you some of what I've been doing in the past uh, 15 years out here away from um, our homeland and um, and not just sitting around eating bonbons. So, <laughs> so it's good to be able to share this with you distinctly. Um, I've changed a little bit of the, the, the title of the talk today um, and because I, I was told by the by the organizers here by STAR that we had um, a, a pretty good significant amount of also Wabanaki peoples that registered. Um, and so, you know, this is, um, you know, this talk is, 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 is close to my heart. 
for those reasons. Um, so regardless, I, I wanted to shift the, the talk in a little, a little bit because I want to engage in where really my heart is, uh, which is with the Wabanaki knowledge uh, mobilization and transfer. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit, certainly about, you know, quite a bit actually. I'll be sharing my time up with um, the main uh, curriculum, uh, Wabanaki studies mandate or directive um, and um, I'll be introducing some terms to you that I have um, been working quite diligently and getting published. And some of those concepts include um, Indigenous knowledge mobilization, anti-racist conviction, um, meta dispossession, um, epistemicide, um, and lastly, and most I think importantly, Red Hope, Jibonog. Um, and so, yeah, so let's just get started. I'm going to share my screen and pull up a PowerPoint here. Okay. And I'm just going to move myself up here. So I can kind of go along with you with these slides, eh? Okay. So the title of the talk is Red Jibunog, uh, uh, Red Hope uh, Jibunog. So um, in our language, Jibunog is like the East um, and uh, Red Hope is a concept that I'll share more with you as I synthesize you know, the talk later on, but it has everything to do with, um, with the hope for today the love and faith and um, in the struggles that we have that we have uh, been faced with and lived through it honors the ancestors um, you know as I talked about my nieces and nephews watching today um, you know red hope has so much to do with that um, and you know it's sort of like I want to treat the land acknowledgement in some ways um, as a prayer um, and acknowledge what Dr. Ibrahampton identifies as, um, you know, no matter who we are, uh, whether we are Native people, non-Native people, um, our ancestors prayed for us. They prayed for the well-being of their descendants. And um, in many ways, that land acknowledgement, uh, when I hear it, um, you know, I think about our peoples, our ancestors of these territories, um, that, you know, the you know, the Abbey Museum sets on even, um, and the universities, you know, certainly rest upon. And I like to think of it um, more so, these land acknowledgements, as um, a pathway to larger possibilities of what can happen uh, beyond just a land acknowledgement. And in many ways, Red Hope and this work calls for that, uh, calls for those possibilities um, that uh, we certainly need far more than just land acknowledgements, um, but they are pathways for us to have these discussions and to call for um, land back, anti-colonialism, decolonization. So the, the title Red Hope, Jibonog, Jibonog is where the sun rises first, it's the east. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I synthesize. So uh, Red Hope, Jibonog and Wobonaki knowledge, mobilization in immobilizing times, um, thoughts on anti-racist conviction and epistemicide. Okay, um, I just want to start out by acknowledging that, um, you know, the, the body of work that I spent, have spent a lot of, you know, my academic or scholarly time looking at um, is this bounty proclamation. And I'll talk, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's a 1755 colonial document that I engaged with in document analysis early on in my um, academic career. And when I published about it in 2008, um, it was it marked the first time that a Wabanaki person had done any sort of analysis, published analysis on the 1755 document. Um, so when you think about, you know, 1755 bounty proclamation, and for those of you that aren't familiar with this bounty, um, it, it's, uh, it's at, actually not your fault. <laughs> um, it's, a heavy, it's a heavily hidden or subjugated document. Um, this, this is the evidence and accounts for the first wave of policy against Maine Indian people. 
um, and it is that of genocide, an, an attempt to eradicate uh, Wabanaki peoples. And these were all along the Eastern seaboard in the mid 1700s, late 1700s. And so not until 2008 um, had a Wabanaki scholar done this analysis on this bounty. And mind you, the bounty has never been apologized for or, um, or removed necessarily. And you know, it calls for the scalps of our ancestors um, and uh, females um, at the time were less worth. Um, and it is, um, you know, it's, it's pretty widely um, understood amongst our own peoples, but not really even so much. Um, so um, late Jim Sapier, um, an elder who's recently passed away, um, I had a discussion with him early on when I was at Harvard, and he had given me a copy of this and asked me, um, he had asked me in, in such an endearing way, you know, as his ways of being, you know, always were, um, does can you make sure that whenever you do any of your presentations, you let people know about this bounty? And so, um, so yeah, it's it's with it's with that um, that I also want to acknowledge and honor, you know, his role in our community. And so, um, so you know, I have subsequently published I don't know maybe three or four academic papers doing various levels of analysis on this bounty. Um, and, you know, it's, um, you know, it's something that, you know, with the new or with the uh, rejuvenated, I'll say, uh, Wabanaki studies law efforts within the state, um, it's something that, um, you know, I know that the Portland public school system is taking up quite seriously and it is one, it is embedded in the recommendations that the Wabanaki Studies Commission um, engaged in those recommendations of, of the need to teach this and teach about the bounty. And so, um, as I was saying, women were, you know, identified as less worth and children were even less. And um, particularly, you know, dead children or dead women. And the most valuable was a live Penobscot man and um, above the age of 12 years old and 50 pounds were compensated. Um, and, you know, in today's um, calculations, if this were sort of roughly um, calculated, it would be, um, about, you know, roughly today, um, of roughly $30,000. And so, um, you know, that it was a, it was quite advantageous, you know, at the time, um, for colonizers, you know, to, um, to, uh, kill Wabanaki ancestors. Um, and so this image to the right here is a, um, is a, actually a postcard of my late great grandma, Elizabeth Andrews of Indian Island, Maine. And um, she is, um, she would have been the first generation to have survived this bounty. Um, and as I did my research and the analysis of this um, back when um, I st started embarking upon my doctoral work, which was back in oh, 2005 and 2006, um, I came to realize in the depths of the analysis stage of my dissertation that um, just that, that she was the first generation um, to uh, survive this bounty. And so it's with her that, um, you know, I, I carry and honor this work and acknowledge, um, you know, acknowledge her struggle um, and the ancestors' struggle in order for us to be here today um, and what they survived. Okay, so um, I'm just going to move the slides or, okay, and so I'm going to shift a little bit because I want to talk um, a bit about Wopanaki woman knowledge in the context of what I just shared in terms of gen genocide um, and make some sort of special acknowledgements to, um, you know, to my mom, Elizabeth Sockbeeson, and um, and that's let's see I don't know if you can see my cursor but that's yours truly right here and these are my seven um, brothers and sisters this right here is my mom um, and uh, she is married to um, my father uh, who's illogical but he helped to raise me up it's his birthday today so happy birthday Buffy um, and um, they are uh, you know my mom you know in terms of what I carry, and I just want to acknowledge, and this is a part, this is part of indigenous research methodologies is locating ourselves. And um, it's also part of indigenous research methodologies to also 
um, you know, cite and acknowledge who has influenced, you know, our, our learning um, and who has mobilized, you know, the knowledge that, that we're sharing. So, um, you know, certainly it starts off with her. And in the face of this genocidal bounty, um, I just want to say that um, North American Indians have survived the largest act of genocide the world has ever known. Um, and that is uh, really significant when we think about it. And how very little people know about that genocide, I think, is even more significant. So um, when I asked a group of social studies teachers um, back in the early 2000s, uh, maybe that was in the year of 2005, at a social studies conference in Maine, um, where there were well over 100 social studies related teachers in Maine in the, at that conference. I had asked them how many of them had taught the diary of Anne Frank, and rightfully so, um, they, most of them raised their hand. Uh, when I showed them the bounty document that I just shared with you there, here, um, I asked them how many were familiar with this document, and uh, less than a handful of people were familiar. And so um, it mobilizes the research. So to understand and to conceptualize that um, before European um, contact, there were over 20 Wapanaki tribes, and today there are only five. And so I like to start off and locate myself, and you know, and locating oneself is, um, speaks to the relationship that I have to the research. It speaks to the accountability I have to my people um, and to the public that are also um, on the lands and the territories of my people. And so I'm part of what I will continue to do, you know, throughout the presentation or the talk here is locate myself. And this is one way that I, I am locating myself is showing you a picture of my family. Um, for the very most part, my mom raised, uh, raised us up on her own. Um, my late father was Passamaquoddy. Um, and passed away, um, you know, in his mid forties, um, with my sister, my late sister, Rachel, right here. Um, and out of this family, my mother now has over, she's got almost 50 grandchildren and great grandchildren. And, um, and so when I acknowledge my nieces and nephews, I do it in such a way that resists the genocide. And um, and honors um, you know and honors the um, the struggle um, and expresses love and so um, so with Wabanaki woman knowledge is is where I want to start um, and that starts you know for many of us that starts with our moms um, okay so I'm just gonna keep I could talk about my family for a while oops here I'm gonna move myself around here I don't want to get in the way of Mary so. And this leads me into, and you know, I'm going to share with you um, a bit about Wabanaki woman knowledge and um, and talk about some women that have had a tremendous influence on my thinking. And um, not all of them, you know, could certainly fit in one PowerPoint presentation, but I, I wanted to share with you um, some key ones that, you know, that have um, had some impact on my thinking. So as we're looking at this um, genocidal bounty, um, Probably in the year of 2000, we had uh, gathered over 50 Wabanaki youth down in Portland to uh, a youth conference for racialized um, for racialized youth, and um, and Mary Bassett, late Mary Bassett, who has passed away over uh, well an, a year ago now, um, is a Passamaquoddy was a Passamaquoddy elder, um, and she was conducting a workshop with the youth and she invited them to um, take off their shoes like she was doing an icebreaker she had them all in a circle and she was you know she started off by saying okay for those of you who have um who have jeans on you know stand up so you know lots of them stood up for for those of you who have sneakers on stand up and then she got deeper into you know um into the objectives of her workshop, um, which were how many of you, you know, have um, have loved someone or have attempted to commit suicide. And um, more of those youth, all of the youth stood up 
and that accounted for more of them standing up than the ones that had sneakers on. And so, you know, there were some that even just that question moved them so emotionally um, uh, to tears. And so she then showed them that bounty document and she explained that we were not supposed to be here. And, um, you know, she went on to explain the significance of um, that we are still here. And you see that a lot in social media, we are still here. And, um, and you know, late Mary Bassett was saying this over 20 years ago, we are still here. And she assured us of that um, and acknowledged that and acknowledged the pain um, associated um, with suicide attempts. And she assured the youth that it wasn't their fault. And so, you know, I want to, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through the slides, but um, that is part of Wabanaki woman knowledge um, is that reminder that we were not supposed to be here and we are still here. Um, and so some of those also, some of that wisdom that she imparted upon me and others was careful to not should on yourself. So, you know, it has so much to do with, um, you know, making sure that, you know, regret doesn't serve anyone. Um, and so, you know, shooting on yourself or shooting on anyone else um, doesn't serve you or anyone. And she also, you know, explained that colonization always gets in the way, you know, it gets in the way of everything. And to remember that as we're working with our own people um, and we, you know, there's something called internalized racism. And we hear of this uh, often about crabs in a bucket. And, um, and she'll say, it's not really, that's not indigenous to who we are. It's the colonization that gets in the way and causes, you know, the, causes the crabs to, to crawl on top of one another. And um, yeah, and so she also imparted that traditionally and historically native women's values determine the course of leadership for the welfare of the entire community. So I'm gonna shift back you know, to the Wabanaki studies law and part of the impetus for that. And I'm gonna go in and out here. So, you know, thank you for your patience um, in advance. Um, and, and if you don't have any patience, I don't blame you. <laughs> so um, anyhow, uh, back in 2000, um, my kindergarten daughter at the time, you know, now she's, she's a young woman, um, had received this card um, at school. She was going to a school in Southern Maine and um, it was celebrating uh, reading buddies and she was in kindergarten and her reading buddy was in fourth grade. At the time we were developing the, um, the curricular expectations for LD 291 or AKA also known as um, the Wabanaki Studies Law. Um, mandating or directing, expecting teachers to teach about Wabanaki people's um, history, contemporary issues, governance structures, economic structures, um, et cetera, um, K through 12. And so that was, um, you know, enacted and in, in to be implemented in 2000. So around the same time, um, myself and others, um, and of course the, you know, the author of that piece of legislation is Donna Loring, um, and, um, you know, who brought that forward and drafted the legislation. And so, um, so at the time we were working together with the state, um, there were several of us um, tribally appointed, um, got, uh, chief and council appointed um, some key people or uh, representative folks to sit on a commission with other education uh, commission uh, stakeholders to develop the curricular expectations for this piece of legislation. And so um, at the time I had, I had organized a think tank and just to sort of hash out, okay, what is it that we, how do we want to go about this? And um, there were several people that were concerned about teaching about the, about the, about the bounty um, and thought that if we taught about the bounty, the genocidal bounty, then the information, like that just wouldn't be taken up. And, um, and it would not be taught because it's very difficult to teach um, about this. And, you know, typically, and I'll, there's um, Britzman has some has some scholarly work on the impact of um, teaching difficult knowledge and lovely knowledge in the context of um, American Indian education or Indigenous studies or Native studies 
that um, as Native people, there is, um, there is certainly, there's so many beautiful and lovely aspects of um, our knowledge systems, which are a lot more easier to digest and far more than the oppressive colonial history. And so within that think tank, there was that rhetoric was, was at play so that there, there was a concern that if we taught about the genocide, people wouldn't want to teach, wouldn't want to touch the Wabanaki Studies Law, which is very, you know, very, uh, that's realistic, right? And so um, in that moment and during that week, I happened to go through my daughter's keys for the week and she had gotten this Reading Buddies card. And, um, and so you can see here that there is a colonial ship shooting, um, shooting at a group of what would look like Indians. And you can see who, who the victor is here. And here's this really nice note by this fourth grader. Thank you for a great year reading buddies. And then, um, you know, this is just a, a close up of, of that image. Um, and what happened, you know, as I was, as I took this out and I, I was going through her things, I asked her, you know, to come see and what, what she, how she understood this. And she said, oh, they're playing that game at recess too. It's called kill the Indians. And so um, I was in disbelief. I just couldn't believe that she was facing this. And, um, and she had, you know, she had turned to me and said, why do they want, oh, oh, oh they, were, they were playing kill the Indians. And she said, this is key. She said that the kindergartners were the Indians, which she, which she was a kindergartner at the time. And the first graders were the, the pirates. And the pirates would chase the kindergartners, um, and they and they played this game, kill the Indians. And so um, simultaneously, she she had gotten this card from her reading buddy. And so I was, you know, in complete shock um, and um, in pain, you know, thinking that she was, you know, living through this at school. And she had said, "Mama, why do they want to kill us?" So clearly, she was including herself in that. She said, "I think it's because they don't know enough about us." And, um, you know, it, in many ways, it was very cosmic that that happened that same week that we were developing curricular expectations for the Wabanaki Studies Law. While at the same time, um, Indigenous scholar Gregory Cajete um, uh, references uh, Indigenous philosophies and says, for many of us as Indigenous peoples, we don't really believe in um, coincidence, you know, and, um, and that these things converge and happen for a reason. And, um, so I raised this within the think tank and um, that it was, you know, it was, um, it was necessary, more than necessary. Um, I, I've written and published about this story and done some analysis in various ways um, that are all accessible on the web. But um, so there's a lot more to say about the school context of this experience. But um, I did go and meet with the kindergartners um, and sat down in circle with them in their morning circle. I handed around, you know, a page, that page of the bounty, a copy of it, and I asked them if they'd been playing the game, and, and they were, you know, very, like, yes, they'd been playing the game, um, you know, lots of sh heads were shaking, yes, and I let them know that, you know, uh, my daughter and I were real Indians, and that that game hurt us, and that at one time, it was a for real game, and that's why it hurts us. And uh, the children in that circle made a commitment to not ever play that game again. And so they were able to critically think without, you know, the blame or the guilt being placed on them. And that this is very key in all of this and in what I am sharing with you. Uh, Barbara Thomas is an anti-racist scholar that writes a letter to her daughter. She's a white woman and she writes a letter to her daughter. And um, she explains to her daughters that, you know, she's like writing a letter to prepare them for how to address racism in their lifetime. And she explains to them that you are not responsible for what has happened um, to um, indigenous or racialized people, you know, um, in terms of colonial oppression, you know, something like this, like the bounty. But she goes on to say, although you're not responsible to be blamed for that, uh, excuse me, let me step back. She says, you are not to be blamed for what happened. However, as a collective, we are all responsible for mobilizing the truth about what happened so that it doesn't ever happen again. 
So responsibility and blame are two very different things. And that in this context, and these kindergartners, they were very, um, you know, and children can critically think very well. I think us oftentimes um, developmentally, um, and you know, the qualitative sciences, social sciences tell us this, that critical thinking at a younger age is, is, um, is, is really, it, there's a depth for it um, that children have. And so certainly if they're playing a game like this, which, you know, they are uh, because of, you know, media, you know, and society messages about indigenous peoples, um, dehumanized messages about indigenous peoples like this, uh, that children can take this up, you know, and they can understand um, that at one time this was a for real game. Okay, then I can't play this game anymore. And so when we met as a think tank, um, I introduced this to my, you know, to my uh, peers and colleagues in that think tank. And the Wayne Newell and <clears throat> I believe Carol Dana and other elders, um, Bernard Jerome um, uh, from up north, um, they asked to meet and have their own little meeting because there was a tension about what to do. And when they met in their own meeting and they came back, they had come back to say unequivocally, um, we need to teach this bounty. This needs to be a part of the Maine, Maine Wabanaki Studies Law. Um, and so I, you know, it's, it's with that that mobilizes, you know, my, um, my thinking and this experience. Um, and there's a lot more to be said about it. And I'm sorry to just sort of brush over it, but I want to mention it as I continue to locate my with you. Um, this is her at kindergarten, kindergarten age. She's so beautiful. <laughs> and that's an eagle plume. She's a dancer. So, okay. And so what this, you know, what, what happens, and I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to talk a little bit about research here now. And so Linda Tahatwe Smith, who wrote Decolonizing Methodologies, um, at the end of her seminal text, which is probably one of the most heavily cited um, and considered a staple in indigenous methodologies and in indigenous research in 1999, um, ends her chapter um, by asking uh, what happens to the research when the researched become the researchers? So when we think about that colonial document uh, being as old as it is, 1755, and the first time a Wabanaki person um, like myself publishes about it, you know, in, in 2008, um, you know, it hadn't really, it hadn't, you know, analysis has been done on it, but not in the way that a Wabanaki researcher um, has done the research or has done the analysis. So she asks, what happens to the research when the research become the researchers? And mind you, her book in many ways was also a response to, um, Denzen and Lincoln write something called the, the, the qualitative handbook, the handbook of qualitative research. And in the academy and in research context, Denzen and, Lincoln, Denzen and Lincoln's handbook of qualitative research is sort of like, for lack of better words, the Bible of qualitative research. And they opened their 2007, 2006 version by quoting Linda Tahatwe Smith and saying that oftentimes in indigenous communities, research is a dirty word. And so, um, you know, this is, this needs to be better understood. And so her book, her seminal book, Decolonizing Methodologies, you know, at the end of her book, she's getting to, you know, this point, which is, you know, what happens to research when those who have been historically researched are doing the research. So when we look at the professoriate and just think about, you know, even our own scholars on Indian Island or Penobscot Nation, um, as indigenous peoples, we are the least likely to confer PhDs. So it's like less than 1% of the whole professoriate in North America are native people, indigenous peoples. So uh, my research asks furthermore, what happens to the research when those who have been historically researched are engaging with our own ancestral ways of knowing and epistemologies within indigenous research methodologies? And what happens to the researcher? What happens to the person? And what I'm calling for in my work is Red Hope. In this, in the context of curriculum mandates, um, what happens to the curriculum when indigenous people are leading um, these? And what happens to educational theory to action? 
what happens to native content instruction when those same indigenous scholars design and determine the curriculum in native content instruction mandates or directives. So um, I assert in my work and in the paper that um, that I've recently published on Maine Indian or Maine Indigenous Education Left Behind, a call for anti-racist conviction. Um, you know, I assert and identify that there are openings for pathways for policy to become decolonized. The content pedagogy uh, becomes revolutionized. So, you know, ultimately, policy informs research informs policy. Okay, and when we think of you know research as a um, when you think of research in a public, in a regional comprehensive public university, like for instance, the University of Maine, or where I work now at the University of Alberta, um, we are in Alberta, one of the most heavily funded research institutions in Canada. The University of Maine um, is, a, is uh, one of the leads and certainly in New England and most certainly in the state of Maine. And um, when we, in the, in the academy, in the university, create or mobilize knowledge and publish about it in academic journals, it's considered knowledge and, and an original scholarly contribution or knowledge. And so when policymakers are developing policy like curriculum policy, um, they are, their approach is informed by research. Uh, most of the times policymaking is informed by research research that they are gleaning is typically the research that has been done in regional public comprehensive universities like the University of Maine, University of Alberta, because we are, we are in many ways um, as professors uh, expected to um, publish in A-listed peer-reviewed academic journals. Um, and those are the ones in the libraries that get cited uh, particularly when policy is developed, either cited or referenced. Okay, so I just want to, you know, share with you the significance of um, of publication in peer review a listed journals, um, and the significance of where knowledge is produced and created. In fact, Sajik Henderson, um, an Indigenous um, lawyer, goes so far as to say that um, the academy is the heart of the beast of oppression. So this is where knowledge is created and legitimized, right? The academy meaning regional public comprehensive universities, large universities. And what I mean when I say that is that regional comprehensive public universities are publicly funded and we have a, ver we have a variety of discipline, disciplinary fields. So law schools, humanities, faculties of education, schools of education. So we're preparing you know, teachers, lawyers, doctors, nurses. Those are regional public, public comprehensive universities, okay? Um, okay, so for the state of Maine, what a lot of people don't realize on another area, because this is the next wave of educational policy against Maine Indian people and people indigenous to North America, uh, that includes Canada, are the Indian residential schools. And the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was the first um, Indian residential school. And proportionately, um, our ancestors from Indian Island, of any other tribe in Maine, uh, Penobscot Indians were sent to Carlisle Indian Industrial School more than any other uh, tribe in Maine. Um, and we know that the days spent in those schools were about labor, child labor, forced child labor, not about academics. Um, there was very little day, hours of the day taken up to learn about academics. And the school policy um, written by a, um, a military officer, Henry Pratt, um, was to kill the Indian in order to save the man. And so, um, you know, that policy impacted and informed all Indian residential schools across Canada and subsequently the United States. And so, as Wapanaki people, not only are we surviving the genocidal bounty, but the next era of forced assimilation. And so um, what that has done, you know, in our communities, and specifically when we think about our ways of knowing and being, um, so that, um, you know, has been devastating, and it is a dispossession, a, system, a systematic dispossession. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about epistemology and as, as big of a word as it as it is it's actually quite simple it's how do we know what we know 
and how does that impact our ways of being in the world? So how do we know what we know and how does that impact our ways of being in the world? And so what epistemology, like, and I use this metaphor to explain what epistemology is because it's all of the stuff that we can't see. So it's the mass all underneath the glacier. And this draws on Dr. Sean Wilson's work um, and uh, who wrote research as Sarani, a Cree scholar. And so um, this mass underneath this little, you know, this little slice of, um, of glacier is, is all of our ways of knowing and being that you can't really, you know, see aesthetically, okay? So when you look at this little boy, Thomas Moore, that went to Indian Residential School, and he's in his full regalia, and then you see him after, you know, with haircut, wearing a suit, um, you see aesthetically something very different, okay? And it's his ways of knowing and being, which are, includes his language, his ceremonies, the meaning behind his hair, the spiritual meaning and significance of his hair, um, his connections to his family um, and his, um, and his um, forced, you know, uh, forced detachment from his family. You can't see all of that, right? So epistemologically, what has happened to a collective of our peoples, you know, and I say our peoples both in Canada and the United States, has had devastating consequences on our ways of knowing and being. So when I say, and when Mary, and I draw on Mary Bassett's uh, late elder, Passaquoddy elder Mary Bassett, when she says that language, low language fluency is not our fault, um, I'm speaking to the intention to eradicate our ways of knowing and being. Okay, so when this little boy went to the school, as many of our ancestors did when they were forced to go to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, they were not allowed to speak the language. And so it accounts for the low fluency in our communities. So we often find ourselves saying, I don't have my language, I lost my language. Um, you know, and I really, in my, in my scholarly work, I work very hard <laughs> in my, my teaching to disrupt that notion of loss because we actually didn't lose it. It's like we lose our car keys. And uh, when we use that word loss, there's an associated accountability with a person um, that I've lost it. Like I've lost my keys and that was my fault because I'm often absent-minded, which I, I really actually do lose my keys quite a bit. But I did not lose my language. Um, my language was systematically, there was an attempt to systematically dispossess me of language. And the language would be part of the epistemology. How do we know what we know as Wabanaki people? And how does that inform our ways of knowing, of, of, of being in the world, the ontology? So I just want to make sure that I, you know, I'm sharing some of those key points because in an effort to mobilize Wabanaki knowledge, uh, it's important to understand where knowledge, where the knowledge has been um, dispossessed of so that we can better respond and recover our knowledge systems. <clears throat> so we're doing that, we're doing that every day by being who we are. Um, and living in this world. Um, and, um, and, you know, so that, you know, the point here is to understand epistemology because it has, you know, it's like, it goes right into like, how do we know what we know and how does that impact our ways of being in the world is such an everyday um, space of engagement. And for so many of us as Wabanaki, I would assert that um, we know a lot more about ourselves than we probably even realize, um, you know, as a cultural people. Um, well, all peoples are cultural and have their own culture, um, but it transcends beyond, um, you know, how we look, um, and it goes in many ways um, and distinctly has so much to do with how we treat one another, what are the principles, you know, of our ancestors um, in engagement with one another. Um, my mother would, would talk to me about, um, and kudos to the Penobscot Nation Cultural Preservation Department for doing such awesome calendars and mobilization about our knowledge systems. But she would always say that, you know, one of the, one of the um, biggest values that, you know, um, that Penobscot's hold dear is generosity. And certainly, you know, the other, other Wabanaki people too, um, that taking care of one another is central to our knowledge system. And you can't, that's part of epistemology. You can't see that, right? 
I mean, in many ways, you can see people take care of each other, but as a principle, that's part of an epistemology, right? And so, because that's a way of the way of knowing and a way of being, and it's indigenous to who we are. It's ancestral. So generosity and taking care of one another is as old as as the dirt and the land of the territory in which uh, we are on when we were in Maine. Um, and so part of my imparting that and sharing that is um, is an effort to recover indigenous knowledge, Wapanaki knowledge. So. Um, so with that, I just, you know, I'll, and I'll share a little bit more about this as I move forward, but so there's genocide that we have survived, right? And we've survived the largest act of genocide the world has ever known. Um, we're still here. Um, and, um, and we've also survived something called epistemicide. So that's the intention to eradicate a whole people's way of knowing and being. And that has, has also not been completely successful. So genocide certainly has not been completely successful. <clears throat> and epistemicide, the intention to eradicate our people's ways of knowing and being, has also not been successful, completely successful. It has had devastating impacts as well as the genocide. But um, you know, a large core of my scholarly work is dedicated to mobilizing the truth around um, that we have survived the genocide and we are also surviving the epistemicide. And um, I'm quite dedicated to acknowledging and identifying the ways in which epistemicide is not complete. Okay, so um, this just speaks to that um, Richard Henry Pratt and the first, the second wave of um, policy against uh, Maine Indian people, um, kill the Indian, save the man, okay. And, um, okay, so I'm just gonna turn to Sipsis because, you know, Sipsis writes in her, in late Sipsis, um, who's also, you know, another, an elder that has had a tremendous influence on my thinking. Um, and she has also passed on. Um, and her writing is, you know, is, um, she's probably published more works um, than, you know, um, many of our, our people in the Wabanaki Confederacy. Um, and, part of what she mobilizes within her writing is that notion of um, generosity. And, you know, she goes so far as to say that, you know, our people and our ancestors considered it a crime, like criminal, to be greedy. Um, when I was a, a younger activist and um, working in Maine, because um, she was always there with us when we did um, protests as well. Um, and after a protest, she was, her and um, Tuffy were feeding us some moose meat, some canned moose meat that she had prepared. And she just really off the cuff, just turned to us a bunch of, um, you know, younger, um, younger radicals, I guess, <laughs> and said, you know, as native people, because we were, what we were protesting was USM was, was doing some, uh, offering some courses on shamanism and it was being taught by, um, by some white um, instructors. And so I think that time that that protest was in response to that. But she had just looked to us and she said, you know, as Native people, we have to think about white people every day. And white people don't ever have to think about us. And this is part of that repertoire that I am um, trying to collect and, you know, think more on in terms of Wabanaki woman knowledge. It's very profound when one stops to think about this. As Native people, we have to think about white people every day and white people don't ever have to think about us. Um, if I were at the Abbey Museum right now and we were at the, you know, Bar Harbor and we were sitting on the ocean, um, I, I would um, also share with you, um, you know, a bit about land dispossession and how land was acquired. Um, and I think that, um, and, and you know via the bounties and I think that this might be a, a good opportunity to interject and share some of that with you because and this is in a publication um, that I wrote in 2017 where I identify and draw on in my research how um, coastal and waterfront pro property was distributed and um, I'm just going to read a, a paragraph here because um, you know, I, I say it so succinctly here and, um, and it helps to sort of, you know, just, you know, get, I think, right to the point. 
So during the mid-1700s, uh, the genocidal bounty was enacted in 1755. Um, indigenous people um, in both Canada and the United States are the least likely to be homeowners in our homelands and our, and, um, or off-reservation property owners than any other group. So we know that unequivocally. Ocean, particularly ocean and riverfront property is even more unlikely to be owned um, by Wabanaki tribal members today. And this is deeply rooted in uh, colonial land dispossession. So the coast of Maine is identified as one of the most beautiful places in the world. There are over 4,000 islands off the coast of Maine, which accounts for more islands than the rest of the eastern coast uh, combined. The majority of these islands are privately owned and considered prime real estate today. Early colonial records indicate that land seizure was based upon the successful capture and or a decimation of Wabanaki people. The scalp bounty was enacted in 1755 and shortly after the American Revolution, 1765 to 1783, land seized by the British were, were either allocated to soldiers or in the case of coastal property, sold to the highest bidders. So um, let me see, I go on to um, quote, um, a colonial account, and this is particular, this is specific to Westbrook, um, Colonel Westbrook, and what developed, subsequently developed the town of Westbrook, which is um, at the mouth of, um, I believe, um, I think, I'm not, I think it's the Presumpscot and Saco rivers um, that empty into, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. And he, um, he calls for, um, and this is a colonial document where he's quoted to say Thomas Westbrook was charged with um, scouting Wabanaki territory in the east and his commission um, as given to him by Lieutenant Governor uh, Doomer was quote you are to take intercept kill and destroy the in Indian enemy in all places where they may be found. So um, you know, it's important to understand how land was acquired. So when we say that um, in the land claim settlement that two thirds of the state of Maine was illegitimately taken from Maine Indian peoples, it is the ac accounts and understanding of land acquisition that are really key um, as we uh, make sense of how, you know, two thirds of course was, you know, and, and I would say even more but, um, you know, with that in mind, so when we're making these land acknowledgements, and I talk about the pathways to something more than just land acknowledgements, it's very important. Um, I want to sort of interlude here, too, and just raise that the North American Indian Tuition Waiver and Scholarship Program has been dismantled. So the Room and Board uh, Scholarship has been dismantled as of 2009. So for many of you Wabanaki um, peoples that are listening in um, were probably like me um, and um, got your degrees via the room and board scholarship and the waiver. So the waiver is waives the tuition and then the room and board scholarship, which is um, which was dismantled in 2009 by the University of Maine system. Um, was central, I know, for myself in succeeding in university. And um, so when we think about land dispossession and the way that that happened, we think about land acknowledgements, right? Um, and we think about um, it, we think about um, certainly the forced assimilation, right? But to, for the University of Maine system to remove something so vitally important to our people, because I know that well over half of the tribal leaders and managers and directors in the Wabanaki Confederacy have conferred their degrees uh, from the University of Maine um, system. And this is an issue of self-determination and sovereignty because it allows us and affords us the right to um, govern and manage our own, our own spaces, our own, our own communities, right? And so um, since that 2009 cut, the University of Maine system has uh, enrollment throughout the seven campuses has dropped in some places 10% and in some places 20%. And that's significant. I mean, imagine if for, for a moment the University of Maine system experienced a 20% drop in all women going to school, right? Um, I'm, I would say that there would be um, some distinct efforts to ensure that that got brought back. 
So I want to, this is, you know, part of my talk here too. When I talk about Maine Indigenous education getting left behind, I include, you know, a call for the recovery of the Room and Board Scholarship um, now and maybe last week. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I just want to interject and, and share that, you know, as I'm, um, as I'm moving through the talk. Okay, and of course, more Wabanaki woman knowledge. Uh, late Rini Atian, um, who was also a graduate of Harvard University, scholar and basket maker, um, spoke at a, a University of Maine, um, a University of Maine um, panel, uh, or I believe it was a like a Women's History Month event, and um, she was talking about um, there were women there um, that wanted to know more about our spirituality um, as Native people. And I was sitting on this panel with her too. And um, for any of those, for any of you that um, also knew uh, Rainey, she was brilliant and very like um, clever in her, in her words and her ability to just talk back. And so she has, um, I've quoted her, you know, several times in my work as saying this, and this gets to that concept of lovely knowledge versus difficult knowledge. She talks about uh, white people, quote, think we are like a convenience store. They like to come in and buy the candy, the M&Ms of our culture and spirituality, and leave behind all the cleaning products like the oppression, colonialism, and racism. Okay. Um, more Wabanaki knowledge mobilization. And so as I, you know, doing my uh, research and, um, and, you know, writing and, and, and particularly my doctoral research, I spent a lot of time um, visiting and on the phone with Wayne Newell, Elder Wayne Newell uh, from Adopt Me Guk, um, Pasmakwadi, who is a, um, you know, an, an expert um, in language revitalization um, and school administrator, you know, in his community and highly revered um, elder as well. As I thanked him for all of the, you know, the knowledge that he imparted to me um, in my dissertation, he corrected me and said, it's not really like that does. He says, it's more like, it's not my knowledge. He said that I have contributed. I like to think of it more like this. Uh, the knowledge is the energy created between us when we have these discussions. That is actually Wobanaki knowledge. And so I learned so much from him in those discussions and how to move forward and how to talk about these matters. Um, and so here I am still locating myself. <laughs> okay, and so I talk about, you know, anti-racism and anti-racist conviction is another term or a concept that I've introduced into the literature. Um, because, you know, and what compelled me to start, start thinking about anti-racist conviction was um, the work that I do, and I teach pre-service teachers, so I'm out here at the University of Alberta. One of my roles is um, I developed a compulsory course for um, pre-service teachers in our faculty of education, and so um, on Aboriginal education. And so um, in that course, uh, students learn about um, indigenous history, um, the treaties, they learn about uh, treaty rights, um, they learn about contemporary issues like um, uh, up here it's called the the 60 scoop and in the in the United States it's referred to as um, you know there's a piece of legislation called the Indian Child Welfare Act that was created in response to the kidnapping of, an, of native children and put into white homes white foster homes and that reality happened certainly in systematic um, in vast amounts in Canada it's called the 60 scoop so part of that course, you know, th those are some of the topic areas that we address in, in the course. And it's called um, Aboriginal Education, the Context for Professional and Personal um, Development. And so um, that's a, a part of the, the teaching and the work that I do here. I, I co-authored the course and helped to develop it. We reach about um, 14 to 1500 students a year with that course. It's mandatory, um, and I will say that to get that course passed through our faculty governance in a university was more difficult than getting the piece of legislation passed <laughs> that is the, called the, you know, in Maine, the Wabanaki Studies Law. Um, going through a university governance system is, um, is, is incredibly difficult, and it took 10 years um, to get that course approved. 
um, and, and manda mandated um, to be compulsory, uh, which it is now. And so um, we, the thread of my area of expertise is in anti-racist theory and anti-racist education. <laughs> and, um, and so um, a lot of what I talk, I'm talking about here, I talk to the students about before they go out and, um, and go teach. Because now within the province of Alberta, we have a provincial mandate like the state of Maine mandate. Um, or the main requirement, the state of Maine requirement. Um, it's actually called a requirement, not a mandate. So the, the, the law is, is, there's a difference there that it being a requirement. Um, and um, so part of what I do in that context is teach about anti-racist theory. And so as I've been developing my own thinking around um, anti-racist conviction, and I recently had a really incredible opportunity to be the Libra Scholar in the College of Education and Human Development um, and um, co-hosted by Native American programs in the Wabanaki Center at the University of Maine uh, while I was on sabbatical in 2018. Um, and I spent a year uh, visiting uh, various classes on the University of Maine campus in the Col College of Education, both undergraduate and graduate level, I was invited to go there to help them think about how they could be in better compliance with the Wabanaki Studies Law, because it's key that we prepare teachers adequately, that we educate teachers adequately, so they can teach about the bounty, so that they, um, it's a content area that they are familiar with. Um, and um, yeah, and so it's really, you know, it's an imperative, actually. And so I look forward to, I, I, I published this paper um, where I developed the concept of an anti-racist conviction because, you know, it takes institutions a certain level of political will and anti-racist conviction to um, strike a compulsory course, undergraduate course, for pre-service teachers, nurses, lawyers. I mean, there's, it, it really needs to go across the board, but my area of expertise is in education. And so anti-racist conviction engages with how to take up that lovely knowledge versus the difficult knowledge. And um, I quote, um, I quote a, uh, an Asian scholar, um, Chagdud Toku here, who says, trying to change the world without changing your minds is like trying to clean the, the dirty face in the mirror by scrubbing the glass. And so anti-racist conviction calls for the holding up of the mirror um, and, you know, and probably like cleaning the dirty face, not the mirror, not trying to scrub the mirror, but to actually scrub the dirty face. And I think that this is particularly relevant, you know, um, as, as we move forward and thinking together with the state of Maine and the University of Maine about how to um, support undergraduate pre-service teachers to be in compliance with the Wabanaki Studies Law as a requirement of the state of Maine. Um, okay, so I want to share with you just some, um, some socioeconomic um, distress factors and, um, and start to sort of wrap this up. So Maine Indian Truths, and this is taken from Census 2000 data. I've looked at the Census 2019 data. These numbers have did very much, okay? Um, but unemployment rates for, um, for the general population, this is all 16 and over, um, is you know 4.7%. For Maine Indians, it's almost triple unemployment. Living below the poverty line, um, the Maine Indian people are living, are about four times more likely to be poor. We're the least likely to be homeowners in our own homeland. Um, so it's roughly um, almost 500,000 homeowners in the state of Maine. And for uh, Maine Indian people, it's just about 2,000. So that's a, that is like grossly disproportionate. Over about 500,000 uh, Mainers own homes, whereas only um, around 2,000 Maine Indians own homes. Um, and in terms of average life expectancy, and this is really stunning, especially in the, in the context of COVID, because we know as, as American Indians, um, we are experiencing higher rates of COVID. And a lot of these issues are associated with poverty. It's certainly not indigenous to who we are. It has lots to do with poverty. And, and the core of the, the issue and the foundation of the issue is poverty. So the average life expectancy um, is 78 years old. Um, 
for the general population. And for Maine Indian peoples, it's 15 to 20 years shorter life expectancy of, um, of 63. So um, girls and women, um, it's even more, um, you know, it's even more uh, dismal, I think. And so, and, and this is taking on, um, you know, this is just exposing some Canadian statistics, which are very consistent with US statistics, okay? Um, more impoverished than any other demographic group. And I'm talking about girls and women here. Um, uh, the highest rates of socioeconomic distress of any racial or ethnic group in Canada or the US. Almost half of Aboriginal women are living in poverty and in North America in general. Um, highest suicide rates up to seven and really right now with the pandemic up to 10 times more likely to commit suicide than white people. More likely to attempt suicide um, than Native men, but men are four times more likely to succeed, quote, um, in their suicide attempts. Native women in North America are, are 10 times more likely to be victims of violence than non-Native women. Um, and because the majority of suicides are committed by young people, mothers grieving their children's untimely deaths are secondary victims. None of these statistics are indigenous to who we are as Maine Indian people. American Indians rank the least likely to attend incomplete university. And remember, you know, and this is really ties into that call for uh, the recovery of the North American Indian Room and Board Scholarship. And uh, mind you, the Room and Board Scholarship just affords a student um, a dorm room with a roommate. So when I say Room and Board Scholarship, I don't want anyone to um, be, um, you know, um, I don't want it to be misunderstood as, you know, receiving money to, um, you know, to live in an apartment, um, and that's another racist rhetoric is that Indians go to school for free um, or Maine Indian people go to school for free. As you can see in what I'm taking up in my research, you know, the evidence is, um, is not only empirical, but very is vast and extensive to say that um, our peoples have not gotten anything for free. In fact, you know, retribution hasn't even been received um, in remote ways. So, you know, a call for a women board scholarship recovery um, is is overdue. Um, and so, and this accounts for in so many ways why American Indians rank the least likely uh, to attend and complete university. So more than 60% of US high school students go on to college while only 17% of American Indian students do. Okay. Um, I can see that I only have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to read this quote that I was alluding to earlier about Barbara Thomas. First, remember that you're not responsible for wrongs committed before you were born, but you can't escape the legacy of those wrongs. You need to understand some history in order to understand your current position in the world and other people's perceptions of you. And you are responsible for what you do now. And so, you know, at the end of the day, and what I want to say, you know, to my nieces and nephews and any young person, indigenous young person listening, is that we are so much more than the socioeconomic statistics. Um, and as a collective of people, I would like us to think about how we can collectively be responsible. That, you know, my, um, you know, my assertions here are to not blame anyone that's listening for what's happened. Um, I am calling very clearly for um, a collective responsibility on mobilizing the truth around these realities. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the um, anti-racism engages with tribal critical race analysis to help us make sense of and unpack these high socioeconomic distress factors and their linkage to being the most heavily legislated against group in North America. So as, as uh, indigenous peoples, we are the most heavily legislated against group uh, we have more laws and policies developed in order to deal with us as an Indian problem. And, and you know, we have a distinct trust or fiduciary res relationship with the federal government of Canada and the United States, which um, ultimate, ultimately means that, and this is why we don't fall within the multicultural context. And right now, the way that the College of Education at the University of Maine is teaching about Maine Indian people um, is in their multicultural course. Um, and we get about a week within a, um, you know, a, an 11 or 12 week course, we get a week of airtime with that course in Maine Indian issues and, and supporting pre-service teachers compliance with the Wabanaki Studies Law. 
So, um, but what distinguishes us as Indigenous peoples is that legal responsibility and relationship that we have with the federal government, which is called a trust or a fiduciary responsibility. Um, and we are Indigenous to these territories. Um, and I, when I say as Indigenous people, we're so much more than the genocide and colonial oppression, I quote Dr. Cor Weber Pilwax, a Cree Métis scholar here that I work with in the University of Alberta. Okay, so um, Indigenous knowledge systems have survived extensive subjugation, deeply experienced by Native communities throughout the, the nation in North America. Um, and this is that epistemicide, you know, um, that I was talking about earlier. Remember that intention to eradicate our people's ways of knowing and being. Um, the, the law was passed in 2001. Um, this outlines, you know, specifically the exact language of the law, um, which are to teach about um, the territories, economic systems, the history, the governance, um, and their relationship with Maine and Mainers. And remember, this is a Wabanaki Studies Law is a requirement for teachers. Um, and so the state doesn't have a statewide curriculum. I would like to give a real strong shout out to the Portland Public School System for their leadership in developing curricular resources. Um, although the state um, had the Department of Education had a dormant um, website for uh, it must have been it maybe have been over 10 years since the Wabanaki Studies Commission dissolved uh, or didn't it never really dissolved but it um, in many ways well the Wabanaki Studies Commission was only struck by the governor to work for three years so we ended our work in 2001 and for about 10 years, even the website for the main Department of Education was dormant for teachers to even access curricular resources. That has been reignited. Um, under this administration with Janet Mills, um, there has been a distinct effort and significant effort with um, Maine um, Education Commissioner Pender Malkin, <coughs> who chairs a renewed uh, work group of Wabanaki peoples um, and works with the Public Portland School District, of course, um, to um, create uh, curricular resources. Um, and so that is happening because Maine, you know, Maine, in, in Maine schools, local schools decide what their curriculum and their, what, what, what the curriculum is going to be. It's not dictated by the, by the state. So, um, but where it's key to work with, um, to work with individuals is before they go out to practice. And so that's where the public university, where the University of Maine has such an important role in the preparation and education of teachers properly. Okay, and so I just wanna end with um, some, some visuals of how epistemicide is not complete. And um, these are just examples of how, um, of indigenous knowledge and love transfer. And, um, you know, in my family, we're very affectionate. And this is something that has not been, it's indigenous to who we are, and it has not been dispossessed from us. This is Jibonok, my son, um, and my children, my baby, who is now a bigger boy now, 13. Uh, but I like to show these, uh, these images uh, and end in this way. Um, and to remind my own family, my own nieces and nephews watching that, you know, they're, um, you know, their gi or their Grammy, um, you know, is very affectionate. And this is part of who we are in our family and in my community. Um, and, you know, so much of that was dispossessed of via colonial, rooted colonial acts of, um, you know, sexual abuse, you know, that happened within by the church. Um, and so the interruption of it, of our Wabanaki love knowledge, you know, has, has experienced, you know, some devastating consequences as well. Um, but epistemicide is not complete, and that's important to hold on to. Um, as I was, and this is Jibonog, so Jibonog, I named my son um, Jibonog, and when I talk about Red Hope, I talk about the hope for the future, um, and I talk about the engagement with knowing this history and being mobilized to do something about it. Um, and our collective responsibility. And so uh, when I named my work, I early on, I knew that I wanted to name it Red Hope because it, you know, there was so much happening in my data collection, as you can see, and what I've explained to you, 
um, that was really profound um, in what these elders were telling me uh, and what I had recorded them saying. And, um, and certainly Red Hope is a space um, of liberation and a pathway to, um, to decolonization and anti-colonial spaces where we can recover our, our own knowledge systems um, and, and under, better understand those principles that I laid out, those ancestral principles and the significance of them. Um, and that will prevail, you know, and I, I firmly believe that. And so Jibunog, when I went to Wayne Newell um, and I asked him, how do you say Red Hope in, um, in the language? And he turned to Brenda um, Dana or Downing, she, uh, I'm not sure which, how she, what last name she goes by, but he had said, Brenda, Jibunog, isn't it? <laughs> and I had already named my son Jibunog. It was actually my son Iktumi named Jibunog, Jibunog. Um, and, um, and that means, you know, he said that, that would be Red Hope. And she said, yeah, yeah, that would be it. And, um, and so I was seven months pregnant. Um, and when I delivered my candidacy paper, when I did my research and it was really beautiful. And so that is, um, you know, that combines with the story of my mom, um, and actually late elder Jim Sapir, you know, had asked her. Um, if she would, at the time she was the eldest uh, counselor um, on the Penobscot Indian Nation Council, and he had, there was a wounded eagle that the, that the um, natural, uh, the conservatory, uh, conserv conservation department had found and handed over to the Penobscot Nation. And they doctored, people doctored, I'm not sure who was involved in the doctoring of the wounded eagle that, that couldn't even walk on one, like one of its legs was broke and a wing was broke. And so its first flight into the air, uh, my mother had uh, been asked to, you know, let the, to dislodge the eagle. And, um, and it's these times where I remember, where I'm reminded that epistemicide is not complete. And, um, you know, and, you know, I am also reminded of our humor as Native people, because my brother called me that night and said, my mother was so worried, she called me on the phone, she said, I'm so worried I'm gonna drop that eagle when they give it to me, that it's not gonna take flight. <laughs> And so, of course, my Jabutas, my, uh, my uh, very much clown-like brother had said to me, oh, he called and said, you know, uh, mama dropped that eagle. I can't believe it. And he was actually just lying and, and goofing around with me. And um, that actually had not happened. And the eagle did take a flight. And so that's all embodies the essence of what I mean when I say Jibonog and Red Hope. Um, and it's there that, you know, I would like to, you know, end the talk um, and take any, you know, work with, um, with STAR to take some questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, we do have um, several questions that have been submitted and um, I'm going to start off with them. I just want to let everybody know in the audience that we are um, prioritizing um, Wabanaki people that are submitting questions at this time, just so that you know ahead. Um, and you are more than welcome to use the Q&A box. Um, and I thought we'd start um, with Chris Newell, who submitted a question. Um, I love the commentary on how invisibility of Native peoples, and specifically Wabanaki peoples, contribute to negative impacts in our youth and in previous generations. Can you describe the experience of growing up surrounded by a traditional knowledge system and later navigating the, intense, the intensity, intensely uh, colonial institution of Harvard? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I, I think that, um, yeah, it has, it was intense because I went into Harvard, I was six months pregnant and I was, you know, um, I mean, it, like in my, the way I would say it is I was knocked up. <laughs> I wasn't expecting, you know, the, the most beautiful thing to ever happen to me in my life to happen. Um, and I was, you know, I was pregnant and I wasn't expecting it. So um, I went in there, um, you know, wobbling around six months pregnant and it was, I felt, it felt intense. And I remember going and it was, um, I had to stop sharing my screen. Oh, here it is. There it is. Okay. Right on. And, um, and I remember, you know, feeling that intensity and, um, and when I would go into my classes, I, because I knew 
that, um, you know, Harvard University has an excellent um, affirmative action policy. And, um, and I felt as though, you know, I had internalized um, the racist rhetorics that I didn't belong there because I, you know, I got in and being, um, you know, a, a, a Wabanaki woman, you know, advantaged my application. So I felt quite silenced when I got there and I didn't talk for a while. Um, and then it occurred to me that, you know, my success there was counted on my um, intellectual contributions and uh, engagement within the classes. And as soon as I started doing that, I realized that not only did I belong there, but I excelled there. And, um, and all I needed was just that door to get open for me. Um, because I wasn't really any, you know, um, I did okay in high school, you know, I did pretty good in university, um, but my GPA was not a 4.0 when I left the University of Maine. Um, it was probably mid threes or early three points. I, I don't really remember my GPA, but Harvard doesn't have a GPA cutoff, nor do they have a GRE cutoff. And so I wrote a really amazing um, statement of intent that late Mary Bassett and Esther Attian helped me to construct. I remember at the time, um, Esther's home on Indian Island was one of the only homes with a computer and a, and a printer. <laughs> and uh, we printed that out and drove it down to Bangor in a snowstorm. I didn't even have stamps. And we got to the Bangor post office and Esther and all of her persistence was running around trying to get stamps from people in the lobby. And there was this one, this one guy said, well, what are you trying to mail? And Esther said, she's trying to mail her application to Harvard University. <laughs> and this one lady said, oh my God, I've got, you know, I've got stamps in my glove box. I'm going to go get them right now. That's so amazing. So we don't do this alone either. And in many ways, I brought my community with me there. Um, and I stand with it today, stand with my community today. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. I had a hard time, Chris, and it wasn't easy. And it was a struggle. And um, I gave birth to, to my daughter there. And on December 19th, I handed in my last final after Christmas. I came back um, in the end of January with her to my new news. And I breastfed her in class. And Harvard University Director of Admissions, when I tried to defer, he's, they said to me, we, there's no such thing as a deferral at Harvard. And um, when you come here, we will totally support you. And they did. They supported me lots. And um, yeah, and it was important, but it, it was, there was still a lot of that internalized stuff in my own head um, that, yeah, was, didn't serve me, but eventually it did because I, I, I got it. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it does. <laughs> um, on the thread of visibility, I would love, what I love about this series and especially your talk, Rebecca, is that our Wabanaki youth can see a presentation like this and see someone that reflects who they are. How important is it for Native people, especially our future generations, to insert themselves in colonial spaces like schools, universities, museums, and in books? Right on. That's such an important question. And in terms of the report that I developed, the LEPA report for the College of Education and Human Development, I have a, a very um, a strategic you know, recommendation that the College of Education and Human Development human development create cohorts of Wabanaki pre-service teachers and they offer uh, pre-service you know, teachers an opportunity because as uh, Wabanaki people are as indigenous peoples, when we self-segregate and have that opportunity to work with one another, our likelihood of academic success increases dramatically. So um, the cohorts for indigenous populations, student populations is excellent. And we do this out here at the University of Alberta. We have cohorts of indigenous um, undergraduate students and graduate students, pre-service teachers um, that want to, you know, that want to become teachers. And they are oftentimes those cohorts are predominantly native students, um, undergrads, and they go, they see one another in all of their courses throughout their undergraduate program. And we need the teachers. Of course, it's it's you know resoundingly important for us to see who we are wherever we go. Um, and particularly in those places um, of, I guess, power, um, because we need to be there in, um, in more significant ways. In regard to um, epistemic and recovering our lost knowledge, how can the balancing of those 
um, border epistemologies and their um, energies occur. I recognize the goal is not to create a dominant way of knowledge of, protect, of production, but how can we achieve balance and equity? And that's from uh, Nolan. Okay, so can you just reread it here? I'm trying to see, is it in the Q&A? So it's the, it's the most recent um, question. In regard to epistemicide and recovering our, okay, lost. Okay, so remember, it's not lost, right? And so there was a, a systematic effort to dispossess knowledge, okay? And so, um, and so it's um, when something has been, when there has been an attempt to systematically dispossess, um, it, you know, there's a, there's a certain level of accountability. It's sort of like in the context of our language, <clears throat> um, although it's not our fault that we have a low fluency, it is entirely our responsibility to recover our languages, revitalize our languages, preserve our languages. Um, and so I recognize the ultimate goal is not to create dominant way, a dominant way in knowledge of production, but how can we achieve a balance and equity? Okay, so because there is, because the knowledge production is at such a, um, let me see, the, like when you think about the university, think about the University of Maine, um, Nolan, and um, we are oftentimes learning in very predominant ways, um, European, Euro-Western knowledge systems, and there's very little opportunity for us to learn our own indigenous knowledge systems within our university experience. And it's a human right for us to be able to do that. Like my position is it's a human right. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a dominance based approach. So I'm not saying that indigenous knowledges are better than or need to be um, um, need to be placed in a way that they are um, They have more legitimacy. Okay. Um, but just to even say that they are even knowledge systems, that they are um, to even, you know, right now the academy and the way that universities are structured, it's rare that universities even identify that um, indigenous ways of knowing and being are a legitimate source of knowledge system. And so, um, you know, in terms of equity and balance, you know, if, if we aren't learning and if we aren't learning about our own knowledge systems as Wabanaki people on our own territory in our own university, then there is a, there is a certainly an, an equity issue <laughs> happening. Um, and I think it even transcends an equity issue. I think it contributes to the ongoing epistemicide against our people. Are you up for one last one? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, what would you recommend as entry points for motivated teachers who want to take the responsibility of satisfying the Wabanaki Studies Law? Okay, awesome. Um, the Department of Education does have, you know, their website is up and running. Um, the Portland Public Schools District has just released um, a, a platform of curricular resources. The Abbey Museum has extensive resources. Um, so those are all, you know, in the in the Portland Public School District, um, and, and kudos to um, to Bridget Neptune um, for, you know, um, being such a strong political activist in that area, um, and you know all of the other, you know, stakeholders in that context. But um, I've just done a perusal of the Portland Public School District uh, curriculum. And um, it is like in predominant ways, it's quite excellent. And they are going to be making, if they haven't already done that, making their curricular resources available. And you know, part of it is just about reclaiming your own education. Um, and so that will you know, be the onus. And hopefully we will see more institutes offered by the universities and colleges in the state of Maine. You know, the onus isn't just on the University of Maine system. We have some Ivy League schools in the state you know, that likely have, you know, more than adequate resources to support these initiatives as well. But yeah, that's a really important question. And I would just say stay mobilized, um, that there are those opportunities and to allow yourself to know that we all make mistakes. Um, and uh, it's better to address it and attempt to make, you know, um, to, to comply, to attempt to comply with the curriculum than to, than, you know, to ignore it, right? Um, and those resources are there those resources are most certainly there. Um, uh, Star, is it possible that I just close with a two to a two minute thing? Oh, Do we have ahead. two minutes left or are we over? Oh no, you can, you can go ahead, that's fine. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say? 
Um, I was just going to thank everybody for joining us, but I'm going to have the last um, um, the last time on on this um, presentation. So thank you so much. Would you like me to turn off my screen so it's just you? It doesn't matter. I I I just want people to hear me. Um, <clears throat> I want to just I, I want to end by uh, singing a song, um, and I want to honor. Um, I want to honor the young people in my family that are listening. I want to honor my mom, my aunt Donna Loring, um, and I want to honor the ancestors and all of the people. There's a lot of people here that I haven't met have had a tremendous influence on my thinking and this body of work. Um, this is all so much greater um, than, um, than even probably all of us put together. But um, in that effort, I want to uh, sing this humble song. Edwina Mitchell explained to me several years back the, the translation in the song. And she said it's, it's really about a group of, of people, like our people or a collective of people going up that mountain or going up that hill. Um, and they're, they're, they are joined in a, in a, in a struggle or they're doing something together, like to get up there together. And um, so I want to off. I want to honor the essence of all of that, um, and you know, particularly the ancestors and the elderly. Right now, we're in a pandemic. I think extraordinary. It's an extraordinary time, and like one of my PhD students says, it's an extraordinary time and requires extraordinary compassion. Um, and so it's with that that I, I want to sing this song and honor this space and honor um, all of which I have, you know, have uh, identified. And what Edwina Mitchell explained to me or explained to a group of us was that, you know, when the song is sung, it's like it's called a humble song, but it doesn't necessarily um, translate all to that. But, you know, when we, when we bow our heads and we humble ourselves or we bow our heads and we know that like our grandmas and our grandfathers are looking over us and they're always with us. Enji Gagamij is a word in, um, in our, one of our Wabanaki languages. It's, I think it's um, Mikama, Bernard Jerome. Um, it could be Maliseet, it's Mikama or Maliseet, but Enji Gagamij is the shadow. It means a shadow, but it doesn't literally mean the shadow. It means that our ancestors are always with us. So for many of us who are told not to step on our shadow, Maybe that's why, hey? But um, so I want to honor the, the essence of that and sing this song for you and just close that way, okay? <clears throat> so, and for any of you that know the song, please sing along with me. Um, and uh, lots of love and gratitude to everyone. Uli um, Wani and Gazelmo Skijinwik, all of my people, huh? Okay. And Chiqui and Elso is like, come together, we come together. <coughs> Chiqui and Elso, the band ala mingit, book must know. Chiqui and Elso, the band ala mingit, book must know. Chiqui and Elso, the band ala
Oldie then. <laughs> Up, chitch.